بکنیم روی مسئله شناخت تاجیکان و مردمان مرزنشین به دو طرف دریای نورود آمو و از یه طرف رفتیم به طرف درواز و بدخشان و جنوب تاجیکستان از اون طرف هم به مرزهای افغانستان و پرسیدیم اون هم دیگر میشناسند یا نه و به این نتیجه رسیدیم که با اینکه مردم از یک قوم هستن از یک زبان هستن حتی خیش و تبار فامیلای هم دیگه هم هستن متاسفانه در این سالهای اخیر خیلی از هم دور شدن گزارش رو به عنوان بیگانه های کنار رود آمو چاپ کردیم ولی از نیزون تا متوجه شدیم که مردم خودشون هم دلان سعی میکنن که دست دراز بکنن در این بازارهای مرسی در این که با هم دیگه رابطه بقرار کنن همون کاری که الان داریم از طریق این برنامه پیشنهاد میکنیم حالا با اجازه شما من به انگلیسی ادامه میدم The panel right now that we are going to start is finally going to put our international friends to whom you have been addressing your comments throughout. Here they are. Now you have the chance to talk to them directly and they have a chance to talk to you directly. The question of the panel is uh, what are the interests and responsibilities towards Afghanistan um, and basically who needs to do what? I'm going to organize our panel in a bit different from what we've seen so far. We are going to have our discussion in three parts. One is going to be about what is the responsibility of each of these uh, the countries being represented towards Afghanistan, and especially what is the leverage they have towards the Taliban. The second is, can there be a synergetic, synergistic, sorry, uh, approach towards Afghanistan? As you know, there's lots of different formats. We're going to talk about that. And briefly at the end, we will talk about whether there is a role, a political role for the UN to start a reconciliation or other types of processes. Uh, the speakers have been introduced. Let me just add some more, excuse me, some more details that are interesting. Ambassador Nasser Andisha, you all know him very well. He's the permanent representative of Afghanistan to the UN. He has served as the vice president of the Human Rights Council in 2020 and he was before ambassador in Australia, um, New Zealand, and Fiji. Charge d'affaires Karen Becker uh, was appointed in August 22, and she's sitting in Doha, uh, uh, out of the US mission for Afghanistan Doha. She previously served as deputy ambassador in Afghanistan between the years 2018 and 2020, and senior civilian representative in Eastern Afghanistan, and has done tours in Kandahar, Ghazni, in 2006 and 7, so she knows the country very well, in addition to her 24 years of experiences around the world on, uh, with the uh, US Foreign Service. Ambassador Thomas Nicholson was already introduced to you at the second panel, and he is a special envoy of the European Union for Afghanistan since June 2021. And Ambassador Maxim Peshkov, he is a Soviet and Russian diplomat, uh, working today as the senior specialist at the Institute of Oriental Studies, uh, he served as the Russian ambassador to Ireland from 2012 to 2017, and as the ambassador of Russia to Tajikistan, 2000-2005, when he was awarded the Order of Dusti of, uh, by the Republic of Tajikistan. He has initiated, he has deep knowledge of the region, he's been participating in the inter tajik rounds in all of them, and was there at the signature of the Afghan, I'm um, sorry, the Tajik Peace Accord, and he was also posted in the Soviet embassy in Afghanistan, 1981-85, and also 91 to 92, and at the Soviet embassy in Rasht and in Iran. So he knows the region very well. He is also, I have to say this to Ambassador Peshkov, the great grandson of the Soviet writer Maxim Gorky, talking about culture. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So. First, let us ask that big question, number one, is what is this global responsibility towards Afghanistan? Uh, we've been hearing quite a lot about, you know, that there is responsibility uh, towards the people of Afghanistan. We have to also be reminded that countries act out of self-interest, national interest, realpolitik, and so, you know, we've also been talking quite a lot about the abandonment, etc. I think today's discussion really needs to go forward. What do we do now? And what is basically the responsibility going forward? Not a responsibility. I do not want us to continue to talk about why did you do this and that. Where can we go now from now on? 
It is not a secret to anybody that there's a many challenges that this Taliban today have to deal with, right? And because of a variety of structural, historical, management issues, there are a number of challenges. They, the humanitarian catastrophe, as we know, exacerbated by natural drought, man-made disasters, etc., and, and um, food insecurity. We're talking about winter coming. There is a looming humanitarian disaster. There is an economic collapse. This comes from this dependent economy that has been operating for the past not even 20, but 40 years at least. And I'm hoping on explorations of mineral resources or these transfers and uh, infrastructure that are not yet developed enough. Right? And, of course, the brain drain, the collapse of the banking sector, the freezing of the assets of Afghanistan's national reserves, etc. These are all dealing, these are, have led to the economic collapse. There is a dismal human rights situation that we have been talking about, we know, and, and we've seen recently flooding back in Kabul and uh, Afghanistan. There is a political crisis with internal divisions within the Taliban and the refusal to establish an inclusive government. There is, of course, this small insecurity. The Taliban have not been able to control the activities of ISIP, ISKP, uh, Khorasan province, Islamic State, neither in Afghanistan nor in the region. So now it's obvious that the Taliban cannot respond to these challenges alone. Even if they had the will, they don't have the capacity, they don't have the resources. The international community is in a very strange position. On the one hand, the Taliban, they want, um, they're not abiding by any of the promises, including of the Doha agreement or the conditionality set for aid. On the other hand, they want international recognition and release of these billions of dollars of uh, uh, Afghan, Afghan central bank assets. So the question is, should we continue to engage with the Taliban or increase their isolation? I know some of you in this room would say um, that we need to actually not engage with them in order not to give them more legitimacy. Others would say that for the sake of the Afghan people, we need to engage. And others would say, real politics oblige, we need to engage. So therefore, let me start by Charge de care. Let me ask you three questions, and I will ask questions by each of the speakers, asking them hopefully for brief five minute interventions for this first round, which is on global responsibility. Who's responsible to replace the US as a primary supporter of Afghanistan? Is there still responsibility and interest towards Afghanistan, or has attention moved to Ukraine or South China Sea by the US? And finally, should we continue engagement with the Taliban without recognition and even without them abiding by the Doha Agreement? Charge Deke, please. Thank you very much. To meet with Afghans, I am really struck by the, the idea that Afghanistan is no longer only a country or a, or a geographic location on a map. It is a community of people who are all over the world. Uh, and so I, I want to start by saying thank you to AISS, uh, to the Center for, uh, uh, for Afghanistan Studies uh, and the region here in Dushanbe, and of course to the government of Tajikistan for giving us a platform to, for communication, because it has never been more important uh, that we understand one another. Uh, and I, have, I was really was quite dismayed yesterday to hear over and over again about American abandonment uh, and about uh, how America has left. And I would gently remind everyone that none of us today lives in Kabul. We have all left. Um, uh, but I do not want you to walk away from this discussion today thinking that the fact that the U.S. Embassy in Kabul is closed uh, uh, equals lack of engagement. Absence does not mean we are not working on behalf of the Afghan people. And I see lots of people waving their hands in the background. I don't know what that means. Well, for regional studies and Afghan studies here in Dushanbe and to the government of Tajikistan for giving us a platform to communicate because it, clearly it has never been more important that we understand one another. Uh, so I'm hoping the microphone uh, helps with that. 
Um, do not mistake the lack of a physical presence of the U.S. government in Afghanistan for the fact that we are not engaged. The focus of the past year has been to replace the tools we used to have with new tools to help the Afghan people. Uh, and the reality is that takes time. It has been a very long year, it has been a painful year, it has been a tragic year. Uh, and I share those emotions with many of you and with your families. Um, but it doesn't make government work faster. Unfor unfortunately, that just is a reality. So, the, so we have had to create, we had to think up, create, and implement new tools to try and help the Afghan people. The United States remains the leading humanitarian, the donor of humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. $1.1 billion uh, in the past year. That does not equal abandonment. We have created, with the help of others in the international community, the Afghan Fund, which is preserving $3.5 billion worth of Afghan money to be used to stabilize the Afghan economy and actually prevent economic collapse. The U.S. Department of Treasury has passed seven general licenses so that the sanctions that remain in place against the Taliban do not impede transactions or activities that help the Afghan people survive. We have championed a UN Security Council resolution to do the same. We have worked with the World Bank to secure another $1.5 billion to provide services to the Afghan people and meet basic needs. We have worked with international banks to facilitate payment transfers from the Afghan Central Bank to European printing companies. These companies are printing new Afghani notes to replace old worn out notes. There is $78 million worth of small denomination Afghanis uh, that are going to be put into circulation and into the hands of Afghan women in particular, uh, but Afghans who, who are still in Afghanistan. The old notes will be destroyed. So let me be perfectly clear. The US government is not providing money to the Taliban. The humanitarian assistance goes to experienced carefully chosen international NGOs. So that's what we've been doing for the last year. To answer the question posed about who replaces us, um, one, America's not going away, whether you like us or not. Um, we take our partnership to the, with the Afghan people very seriously. It is not perfect. It is not sufficient. It needs to improve. All of those things are true. It does not take away from the fact we are still actively engaged. But the truth is, the real replacement for the United States and the international community are the Afghan people. And you always have been. And so questions and conversations that begin with what is America doing to, to help Afghanistan need to be reframed as what are we going to do? What can we do to help the Afghan people? Talks about politics, talks about constitutional rights, talks about a new political system, those are important. Um, but each and every one of you should also be having conversations about how do we help Afghans survive? Because a political process is going to be long uh, and it is going to be time consuming. And in the meantime, you have to do everything you're you can do uh, to, help your, to help your countrymen and women in Afghanistan, also those who are in difficult straits around the world. Does that start to answer the question? Okay. Should engage or not directly? Thank you. Uh, Ambassador. The question of, of accountability to me is intimately linked to what we were talking about yesterday, namely legitimacy. I think you can base or um, um, a government uh, can base its authority on different sources, as we know. Traditionally, historically, it can be seen as given by God, it can be seen as given something uh, that was inherited, it can be based on tradition and norms, but uh, these sources of authority does not, do not provide legitimacy. And legitimacy is crucial, I think, and as I mentioned less yesterday, also for the long-term, for a long-term stable Afghanistan. 
three questions on, uh, on accountability. First, what are the sources accountable towards what? Secondly, how do we follow what's going on? And third, what would be the consequences? I see three sources of accountability. First of all, it would be the Taliban's commitments to the people of Afghanistan and the expectations, the legitimate expectations and the rights of the people of Afghanistan. Secondly, as I think I mentioned yesterday, Afghanistan's international obligations when it comes to human rights uh, conventions, for example, and international law more broadly. And thirdly, bilateral commitments. The Doha agreement has been referred to repeatedly, but it's of course not the only agreement between uh, partners, friends, international community members and the, and the Taliban. And there it's a responsibility, I think, for each, uh, each of the countries involved in the informal or formal agreements to hold the Taliban accountable. Secondly, to be able to hold them accountable, we need to know what's going on. And there I'm extremely concerned about the clampdown on media inside Afghanistan, the restrictions, the intimidation, the violence against journalists. Um, and also then, and that leads to in many cases a self-censorship among Afghans, which is, which, is, uh, which is very much a concern. But we still have some, um, some ways of having a better understanding of what's happening. We have UNAMA presence on the ground. Many of the countries represented here uh, have embassies still in Kabul. The European Union is still present in Kabul and travels throughout the country frequently. And we have the Special Rapporteur for the Human Rights Situation in Afghanistan, Richard Bennett, who has a clear mandate in this field. Thirdly, what would be the consequences in case the Taliban are not fulfilling their obligations? And here again, I would divide it between the three sources of accountability. First, there's a question mark how the people of Afghanistan will respond. And we have seen some courageous responses and demands and demonstrations and uh, inside the country and a willingness by Afghans outside also to, to support. Secondly, when it comes to the bilateral, uh, bilateral agreements, it is very much the responsibility of each country involved in, who have signed formal or informal agreements, to hold the Taliban accountable. And that will be done, I think, through dialogue, messaging, as assistance give, being given to them or not, trade agreements or investment agreements being signed or not. These are, of course, all quite blunt measures, but, uh, and they can probably be expanded. And when, it, and when it comes to the international consequences, well, there are, uh, we have the ICC that could play a role, the International Criminal Court. We have, we could discuss, or one could discuss, possible sanctions linked to human rights violations. And one could discuss whether there is a need for additional or specific accountability mechanisms. What I don't see in any of these cases is why we should stop our talks or our engagement. We all know, I think, from personal experience that um, being exposed to silence can be a quite powerful form of, of communication, but it is also a very blunt instrument. The engagement we are having, and I guess I'm running out of time, uh, with the Taliban is not only based on the EU so-called benchmarks, but very much linked to the UN Security Council Resolution 2593 of 30th of August last year. Which, uh, which we have all, all signed up to. And there are the same, similar issues, similar questions mentioned, mentioned there. Our engagement so far, different perhaps from some engagement of other players, and that was referred to yesterday, is neither transactional. We are not being transactional. We are not tactical. We are principled. And that may also partly explain why we have not received any immediate results. We are not talking about individuals, we are not talking about transactions. Uh, our question today is not whether we should finish negotiations or end the negotiations. Our question is whether we see reasons to start negotiations, whether we have a trusted partner, a partner that is Countries like 
Russia and China, they also have interest in security and uh, stability and prosperity of Afghanistan. But uh, there is hesitation to fully engage. What should be their responsibility and that of regional countries? What type of pressure can you put on the Taliban? از همه خیلی متشکرم از آقای مرادیا از آن که ما افتخار دارم که اینجا اشتراک میکنم در این کنفرانس خب این شروع صحبت ما ما نویسنده نیستم با اجازه شما I will speak about the very mournful situation uh, in humanitarian, uh, humanitarian uh, sphere um, of Afghanistan and then of course I will uh, try to answer uh, the questions that our uh, esteemed moderator ordered me to answer. Okay, so Afghanistan has been one of the world's uh, poorest countries for, the, uh, for decades but the economic crisis worsened after the collapse of uh, the government in August uh, 2021 and the Taliban okay, regime faced national economic sanctions. By the way, if you want to uh, listen but by your head uh, sets the direct speech of the speaker, please press zero on your head sets. Uh, okay. Now for uh, nearly two uh, decades, development and humanitarian activities in Afghanistan have largely been funded by the United States and European countries whose aid uh, has declined uh, significantly since the Taliban regained control of the country. After the arrival of uh, the Taliban in a poor civil uh, war to the country, Foreign aid, which previously amounted to 45% of national GDP, stopped flowing, uh, according to a, a World Bank report on the uh, causes of this crisis in Afghanistan. By the way, any country is considered dependent on foreign uh, aid uh, if uh, foreign injections account for 10% uh, or more of its uh, GDP. So, uh, foreign assets uh, of central bank of the country worth about, uh, well, between seven to uh, nine, and nine billion uh, dollars were frozen. In addition, access to resources was suspended by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The, country, uh, the country's banking system was on the verge of collapse. Prices for food, medicine, and other necessary uh, uh, goods increased, and poverty and unemployment increased. There was a uh, significant outflow of human capital. Tens of thousands of highly skilled workers fled the, the country. In addition, restrictions had been imposed on women uh, employment in the private and, pub, uh, and public sectors. As a result, the number of women employed in the uh, economy has fall, fallen sharply from uh, 1998 to uh, 2019. Uh, the proportion of women increased from 15 to 22 percent of all workers. However, in 21, after Talibs came, this figure fell again to 15 percent. Uh, back in January 22, the UN and its partners uh, called for 5 billion in humanitarian assistance to uh, Afghanistan, the largest appeal for uh, aid uh, to a single country ever. However, the UN, uh, the UN has only managed to raise uh, 1.4 billion in eight months. In addition, there has been criticism that some areas as are at a disadvantage in the distribution of aid, one of the most problems, distribution, which exaggerates the ethnic and religious marginalization 
of the region and the uh, persecution by the Taliban. Uh, WFP alone has requested uh, 1.1 uh, billion to continue monthly food and nutrition delivery to 15 million of food need uh, in Afghanistan over the next six uh, months. Uh, so, uh, the uh, nowadays, the attention of the international community to the situation in Afghanistan is gradually decreasing. The humanitarian appeal from, uh, for Afghanistan is 55% uh, underfunded, uh, with a marked lack of large contributions, uh, contribution from Muslim donors. It's uh, quite an interesting thing. Uh, the, uh, by the way, the world's Muslim populations population reaches uh, 1.8 billion, and Afghanistan is uh, not uh, the only country in need of uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, but uh, from Yemen to Syria and Somalia, many Muslim-majority countries are facing new, uh, natural or man-made disasters that require an immediate humanitarian response. For example, Saudi Arabia has announced that it will provide only uh, 11 million in humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, Saudi Arabia has said uh, severe... Oh, you speak loudly. I will try. Okay. So... So, I will not go into details. Uh, I, I'm sure you all uh, you know the uh, dramatic situation in humanitarian well, uh, sphere of Afghanistan. So, uh, I will have only uh, one point uh, to out between uh, our country and uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and I will try to, uh, well, reflect on the summary uh, of the relations between two countries. Uh, if we uh, look upon the uh, economic economics and economic cooperation between two countries, uh, we must uh, remember this uh, uh, such pro uh, project and uh, power station. Uh, Jalalabad uh, agricultural um, uh, complex, gas complex in uh, Jurjan, uh, gas and uh, uh, chemical um, complex in Mazari Sharif, uh, Jankalak uh, plant in Kabul, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, more than 130 projects which were built and constructed with the help of Soviet Union. Uh, some of them are now uh, working, some of them are standing, and I think that uh, if uh, all these uh, projects would uh, begin to work properly, uh, it would be a, a kind of uh, help to uh, this poor country first. Uh, second, uh, we are now, uh, we are trying to give some humanitarian uh, assistance to uh, Afghanistan. It means that uh, we are sending some food. We are, now we uh, signed agreement to uh, send some, uh, what's called, Gandon B4C. Uh, to uh, Afghanistan. Now we are working upon, uh, upon a project of uh, delivering some uh, oil and uh, oil products uh, to Afghanistan. So it's uh, the work we are working now. Now I'll try to answer uh, this very interesting question. Okay, should we engage with the Taliban and uh, if so, how? Who knows? Uh, of course we should engage and 
not only we, at, uh, as soon as I know, all countries who are well uh, having their interest in stability of this uh, in this uh, region, uh, and I will try to uh, well reflect on the summary uh, of the relations between two countries. Uh, if we uh, look upon the uh, economic economics and economic cooperation between two countries, uh, we must uh, remember this uh, uh, such pro uh, projects dam and uh, power station. Uh, Jalalabad uh, agricultural um, uh, complex. Gas complex in uh, Jurjan, uh, gas and uh, uh, chemical um, complex in Mazari Sharif, uh, Jangalak uh, plant in Kabul, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, more than 130 projects which were built and constructed with the help of Soviet Union. Uh, some of them are now uh, working, some of them are standing, and I think that uh, if uh, all these uh, projects would uh, begin to work properly, uh, it would be a, a kind of uh, help to uh, this poor country first. Uh, second, uh, we are now, uh, we are trying to give some humanitarian uh, assistance to uh, Afghanistan. It means that uh, we are sending some food. We are, now we uh, signed agreement to uh, send some, uh, what's called, Gandon, B4C, to uh, Afghanistan. Now we are working upon a project of uh, delivering some uh, oil and uh, oil products uh, to Afghanistan. So it's uh, the work we are working now. Now I'll try to answer uh, this very interesting question. Okay, should we engage with the Taliban and uh, if so, how? Who knows? Uh, of course we should engage and uh, not only we, at, uh, as soon as I know, all countries who are, well, uh, having their interest in stability of this, uh, in this uh, region, they do engage in various, uh, well, uh, forms and methods. Uh, I mean trade, uh, attempts to, well, uh, begin some economic projects and so on and so forth. Uh, as for uh, our, uh, well, could be real in this uh, uh, dimension, well, I spoke about it. Countries, uh, prosperity, but on the other hand, there is hesitation uh, to fully engage and so on. Well, you see, uh, uh, we must understand uh, what does it mean fully engage. To recognize officially, no, we are not ready. And we will do, uh, do it before uh, Taliban uh, will um, change their uh, attitude towards uh, those, uh, well, good words uh, that they didn't um, uh, fulfill uh, while they were speaking before Doha, in Doha, after Doha, and so on. No, uh, well, mm, fight with uh, drugs, uh, no uh, inclusive government, uh, no uh, any steps uh, towards uh, human rights, and so on and so forth. Uh, then, uh, what leverage does Russia have to be heard by Taliban on its demands? Hmm? It depends on the real situation. Uh, any country, as I was speaking before, uh, uh, any country, uh, all countries who are interested in uh, the stability in Afghanistan, uh, they are, and we are, uh, trying that uh, our demands, our ideas, 
uh, will be uh, well looked uh, about, looked on by uh, Taliban. Their reaction is uh, rather uh, complicated. Why? Because the uh, leadership of Taliban is not uh, united. There are several trends. Uh, trends between two, well, uh, branches of uh, Taliban uh, movement. The uh, moderates and radicals. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a chance to speak again? Thank you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, thank you very much. It's my audience. No, no, you can It's yours. Okay. Ambassador Bichet, you've heard uh, different perspectives. You recently wrote an article in the Atlantic Council lamenting that the international community's response to human rights violations is weak. Uh, should they engage? How? If not, what other mechanisms would you suggest providing assistance to Afghanistan? Picking up on the discussion with uh, تشکر بسیار زیاد بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم به نام آن که دل کاشانه اوست نفس گرد متای خانه اوست میخواست از همه از انستیوت مطالعات استراتژیک افغانستان و دست اندرکاران این انستیوت تشکری دارم و همچنان از انستیوت مطالعات افغانستان و منطقه در کشور دوست برادر و همزبان ما کشور تاجیکستان به خاطر ایجاد زمینه برگزاری کنفرانس امنیتی ایرات در شهر زیبای دوشنبه در این شهر ما خود را در خانه احساس میکنیم با تصرف کوچک در شعر شاعر جوان و انقلابی ما نجیب بارور ما میخوایم صحبت خدا آغاز کنیم هر کجا مرز کشیدند شما پل بزنید حرف هرات و دوشنبه و سر پل بزنید دختران قفس افتاده کابل عزیز گل از باغ خراسان به کاکل بزنید so with this i heard a lot that you know there have been too much poetry in this discussion but we can't help it you know we came from the land of poetry and we have to start it with that yeah, uh, but, but that doesn't count in my minutes. I think that's, that, that's bonus. <laughs> Since we are in Tajikistan, okay, you can't do that. Uh, I think on terms of the engagement, I think my answer will be yes. I think engagement, you know, you're asking a diplomat will we engage or not. And my answer is definitely we need to engage. Even not engagement is a kind of engagement. Uh, but, but certainly the, 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 the job is engagement. But I will answer your question. In, in, I think, under two headings. One is what the people of Afghanistan are engaging and how they are engaging, and what is the responsibility of international community and how they are engaging. In terms of the people of Afghanistan, we are engaging the Taliban. People are engaging the Taliban. They have been engaging them in the past. We are engaging the Taliban from the day one, from the streets of Kabul, when our women got out and started protesting for their basic rights. We are engaging the Taliban in the universities, we are engaging them in the media, but we are also engaging them in the mountains of Hindu Kush. So I think all kinds of engagements are there, and that engagement continues. But when it comes to the international community, and now from where I stand, and that is Geneva, the engagement with the Taliban has been very clearly defined in UN Security Council resolution, which renewed the mandate of UNAMA resolution 2020, March of uh, uh, this year. But there are four areas of interconnected engagement with Taliban. I think sometimes when we talk about engagement, people think that engagement is only humanitarian. Of course, Afghanistan is a dire humanitarian and human rights situation, and international community has a responsibility to engage. But for that humanitarian engagement and human rights crisis engagement, uh, there is always some principles, and that principles of independence, impartiality, and unimpeded access to the vulnerable communities. So 
If there is engagement, of course, we have to be really careful of all these three principles of humanitarian engagement. We added one more principle to this. I know there is always disagreement. That in 21st century, humanitarian engagement cannot be devoid or isolated from basic human rights and gender participation. So we are advocating for this very clearly in Geneva, that whatever international humanitarian engagement is in Afghanistan, it has to be gender sensitive and it has to take care of the basics of the human rights. Of course, not conditionality, but this is a different thing. On the areas of human rights, I think that has been the most robust area of engagement, which is, again, I'm talking about these four areas in the Security Council Resolution, which is human rights. But then a third and very important one uh, is political process, which the resolution is very clear about it, and political dialogue for creation of, quote, unquote, inclusive or representative state in Afghanistan. So on the human rights, where I come from, from, from Geneva, I think the engagement has so far been robust. Of course, not to the expectation of the civil society and, the, and especially women of Afghanistan, because you know, we, are, we are asking for more. But uh, I don't want to repeat what uh, uh, Ambassador Nicholson said about you know, a very strong uh, special rapporteur, which we call it special rapporteur plus plus, because it has a mandate of documentation it has a mandate of uh, forensic, and it has also a mandate of monitoring. Is it enough? Certainly not, because what happens in Afghanistan right now is very clear violation of international humanitarian law, and these crimes amount to crimes against humanity. In one hand, what happened in Spinboldak, in Ningarhar recently, this killing of prisoners of war in Panjshir, in Takhar, and, and recently in Daikundi and places, forced displacement of people in the north. I think these are all very clear cut violations of human rights, which should be looked at from an independent monitoring mechanism. And this is what the women of Afghanistan, who are very strongly presented in Geneva and also in Brussels, pushing for international organizations are pushing for, and some states. And I think we are going to reach there, either a fact finding mission or a commission of inquiry uh, or, or something like this. I think there is that desire, but I think it's slowly escalating toward that. But still, the engagement is with the uh, special, special rapporteur on the situation of Afghanistan. And, and why that's very important, I wanted to make this sure, that the question of special rapporteur is not only, or, or you know, moving toward a, an independent investigative mechanism, is not, not only for, for a PR stand. I think it's very important for protection, but as well as from prevention of further atrocities. Because if there is a mechanism of accountability, unlike some believes that Taliban are impervious to pressure, I think they are not. Maybe as a, as a terrorist come insurgent group, they were impervious to, to, to sort of international pressure. But at this stage, as you know, de facto authority, they are very well understand and they can feel the heat of international pressure, especially when it comes from a principal international approach. And we see some of their recent retweets or tweets or responding to tweets, which you know, really opens their disgusting uh, face. So I think that's, that's the other one. So on the, on, on, on the, the, the last one, and that is the, uh, the situation on the dialogue, where unfortunately either UNAMA does not have now the latitude, the bandwidth to do it, because I know they are struggling. I wish they were here to respond to this question, you know, myself. But, but what we see from where we see it, that they are basically now confining to this area. I mean, area of human rights is also, they, I mean, they, no one, what I heard is no one has access to the place of detention right now in Afghanistan, which is part of, you know, uh, monitoring uh, of the situation. So. We have to move to the third element of UN Security Council resolution, and that is engagement with Afghanistan civil society, with Afghanistan's women movement, and with the political process. And on this, I think attempts are going on, and, and we are you know, making uh, some headway uh, toward this. Uh, so my final point is that engagement should not be one-sided. Engagement should have, um, I, I hate to say carrot and sticks. It has to be two ways. In one way, we have to engage, but on the other way, we have to be very cognizant of the UN Council, uh, Security Council sanctions. These sanctions have to be applied smartly, but in a very dynamic way. And on this, I think it will add to 
uh, uh, to robustness of international engagement because from the international, from, especially from the Afghan civil society side, this engagement is seen, that's, you saw a lot of these you know, doubts and questions, somehow one-sided because nobody sees the other side, but I saw the other side of you know, not extending the travel bans. And, and there, is a, you know, there is many mechanisms, maybe in the question and answer I'll discuss that what are some of the ways that beside you know, stakes, which including the Afghanistan Fund in Geneva, which you know, we are engaged with, we can also use the stakes. Uh, uh, Carol, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. This, uh, new, this is the first part about this question of engagement, and it's become clear that uh, we have to engage, not just with the Taliban, obviously with the people. The people, and also the question that uh, Shajideke said, uh, the people, the Afghans themselves have to also engage, and they are. We also have heard that there's engagement in different areas and because of national interest, because of uh, you know, the economic, uh, relationships are going on. We hear that the, 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 you know, so I also, what message I'm also hearing is that there is bilateral engagement, um, there is people, and then the question is what about a kind of a international community? Do we actually have a, uh, is there force in, in combining all the different engagements? Is there a united front? And that brings me to my second part of this question that there are many different formats right now in which these types of dialogues or engagements are taking place. Um, there, was, is there, uh, there are many different global interests in Afghanistan, but are they in tandem? These multiple, multilateral processes, is it a good thing to have them? The US dealt, dealt, deal with the Taliban um, concluded the Doha agreement. It was bilateral. The Taliban are not meeting their term. The EU is engaged with its five benchmarks. The Moscow format that we have heard a bit on, but perhaps you can hear more about, it brings together Afghanistan, Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, India, and the countries of Central Asia. Afghanistan was not involved recently. The, the, the uh, pressure on that is on this inclusive government, taking into consideration all ethno-political groups, uh, eradication of terrorism and narcotics. And there's also the Chinese Tungsi initiative, spearheaded by China, which brings together China, Iran, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, the countries of this region that have a belief that we need to support peace building to infrastructure projects. And that they're talking about in actually engaging, they favor engagement with the Taliban in order to integrate the country into the global economy. So we have many different formats, different types of uh, emphasis, different agendas, different partnerships, different memberships. The question, starting with Ambassador Nicholson, can there, should there be these different formats? Is there a good thing? Or does that give actually the Taliban more opportunities to play groups against each other and create different blocks, Eastern Bloc, Western Bloc, etc.? Thank you. Thank you. Um, more, than the, more than the format, I think the messaging is important. Uh, the consistency of messaging, that we say the same things, that we insist on the same values and principles and, and demands and remind uh, the Taliban of their, of their obligations. Um, when it comes to processes, first question for me is really what is the aim? And from an EU perspective, the aim of engagement is not uh, a one-way street towards recognition. Uh, the aim for us is to support in whatever modest way we can a prosperous, stable, peaceful Afghanistan where people have a voice, in other words, a legitimate uh, and inclusive government and where rights are respected. And I think it is important, it's not just semantics, I think it's important to have the, the headline right for, right for whatever process we have. Um, we are currently often hearing that it's difficult to agree on Afghanistan because of geopolitics. Yes, but you know, let's also not fool ourselves. The world was not a, a rosy and fantastic place where we were all friends until February this year. New challenges have been created, but uh, they can be overcome and they have been overcome in the past. There are a number of initiatives, as, as uh, you referred to. There is a 6 plus 1 initiative, the immediate neighbors plus, plus Moscow. Uh, there, is, there was a Tashkent conference in July this year, which I think was very useful in terms of bringing everybody around the table. Um, and I thought 
in terms of messaging and fairly consistent messaging to the Taliban, I thought it was useful. Uh, but I think we would have needed some time also to talk among ourselves before speaking to the Taliban. I welcome uh, also the Moscow format and the attempts by Moscow to bring actors together. And I particularly welcome that inclusivity has now sailed up as a more prominent feature in these declarations. It was always there, but it was much more, more prominent in the declaration this time. I regret, and then we're back to geopolitics probably, uh, that some of the main actors that are supposed to pay and contribute, such as Japan, uh, the US and Europe, are not involved. We are always mentioned in the last, uh, last paragraphs of the declarations. So I think that could indeed be an, an idea of trying to combine these formats. Let's go in some format. Let's say the Tashkent plus, plus Moscow. And I think we will come back probably to what role the UN could play in that sense in the, in the last session. Um, final, finally, I think we need to, to think what, what, what are we talking about? What are the options for, for such international conferences? One is, of course, international community or friends negotiating directly with, with the Taliban about Afghanistan. This has been tried in the past. A second option, and that was an interesting idea I thought mentioned yesterday, was a very different process where an international, through international UN-led facilitation, a process could be found leading to a new political setup. That's very different from having the Taliban as their counterpart negotiating. And a third option, I guess, is a process where Afghans negotiate directly with the Taliban. And in that case, there are two difficulties. One is, why would the Taliban be willing, given where, that they feel they are in control? I think we can give them all the, all the arguments about long-term stability, and they're not ready to listen. And there, I think, there is a need also for international, international pressure and for pressure from inside. And the second question is, and that the Taliban will throw back at us, with whom should we negotiate? And that I touched on briefly yesterday. That is, again, for Afghans to decide and to find a way where legitimate uh, people can be, be involved. I want to underline that in all these processes involving women, youth, and civil society is crucial. The way we do that may differ. Are they in the room? Are they just listened to and, and their voices amplified? That will depend on the process. But if we only listen to uh, Afghan men who, are not, who do not fall in the youth category, we're probably speaking to about 20% of the population, and that is not acceptable for any inclusive solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Peshkov, would you be able to respond a little bit about um, what the Moscow format, plus Tashkent, actually, would be? It's an interesting proposition. Um, not uh, government or uh, state servant, uh, so I'm speaking from the scientific, well, uh, point of view and uh, from my own uh, view on the situation first. Uh, about these two formats, um, I'm sure that uh, mm, this uh, number two is uh, not uh, the whole uh, system, uh, the whole complex of uh, those, uh, well, uh, the tables, round tables, uh, which are uh, round which the uh, problem of uh, Afghanistan is spoken for. But uh, I'm sure that uh, all these uh, formats, uh, all these round tables, all, all these conferences are necessary. And by the way, I'm uh, sure that uh, not only this Moscow and uh, Tashkent formats are working upon, uh, are trying to work uh, upon the uh, Afghan problem. Uh, our today's meeting has the same aim. So uh, we can uh, plus uh, our today's and yet and yesterday's uh, works to Tashkent and Moscow, uh, well, uh, formats and so on. Uh, all of them are necessary. If uh, we uh, begin to speak about the necessity or no uh, non 
is necessity of uh, Taliban taking part in all these discussions? Well, it, uh, from my point of view, it uh, would uh, depend on the attitude of Taliban. Uh, would they want or uh, would they not want to take part in all these discussions and so on? But the main idea is that the uh, Afghan problem could be solved only by uh, Afghanis themselves. As for us, uh, I mean international uh, well, community, be it Moscow format, uh, be it uh, Tashkent format, uh, be it uh, our today's uh, conference, uh, we could be as a, well, uh, sincere assistance. Uh, we can render our maybe uh, good advices uh, to exchange ideas with uh, Afghanians. But the final decision, final resolution is in the hands and in the heads of uh, Afghanians own. Uh, our aim is to help. Thank you very much. Uh, how can we ensure the broader, broader participation and presentation of people of Afghanistan? The fact that uh, in these various formats, but just in the course of the last two days, that when you think about what's going on all over the world, when you have American speakers, Russian speakers, and Iranian speakers finding common ground on Afghan women and girls, dialogue, and inclusivity, I think that speaks to the degree to which the international community is paying attention to what is happening in Afghanistan. The harder thing is, of course, what to do with that. And that's where we all get tripped up. What do we do uh, with all of our support? Um, and this is where, where Afghans come in. Because I think that the part of the reason why these platforms have proliferated is because there's no Afghan platform to unite us. Uh, and, and one of the things I have asked my team for us to work on is to try and connect groups of Afghans in Afghanistan, but all over the world, who all are trying to figure out how you get to a dialogue among Afghans that charts a, a permanent course for the future of the country. And so I, I think, and, and I think uh, my colleague Ambassador Andisha will talk about civil society in greater detail, but I think it comes back to what I said in the beginning. This is, the future is as much your job, more your job than it is the international communities. Because we're trying to figure out how to, recon how to, how to affect reconciliation, how to affect unity, and ultimately how that helps governance uh, in Afghanistan. The international community is not going to do any of those things. You are, uh, and Afghans everywhere. So we need uh, we need your input. We and I have spoken to some of you who have ideas. I'm not suggesting there be one united Afghan group because I know how hard that is. Uh, uh, and when and when Afghans start to make lists about who should be included and who shouldn't, that process can go on for months and years. Uh, but, but there should be a common narrative and a common set of obje objectives that can be united into an Afghan platform that the international community responds to. So that would be my answer to the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Chef, your views Let on me see if I try from here. Am I loud enough? Yeah. Oh, and also you can maybe also answer the question of, within, I mean, there's, uh, within all of these formats, what about Question of neutrality. Okay. <laughs> Connect to Thanks. Uh, I think on the on the question of formats, I just wanted to say that you know, following the other speakers, uh, perhaps in a different way, that why each formats were created in the first place. I think it was be because of differences and in interest or perceived interest of the host of each format, because they. You know, the farmers are proliferated because one post thought that they don't have the, you know, the place they desire on the table in the other. Forms. 
And I think that's why they wanted to have the ownership of this format. Uh, so to, to, to make it sharp, it's basically on the basis of interests of those, not, you know, as uh, uh, Karen said, uh, the people of Afghanistan that much. Uh, and some of these interests are contradictory. Contradict and, and your question is that, you know, how, uh, and I don't want to expand on the nuances of how they contradict each other. I think it's, we leave it for the audience, very the audience here. But the answer to that question is that, you know, how we can bring all this competing form under one, and I, and I, you know, I, I concur with uh, the previous speakers that I think given the changes in Afghanistan after, after August uh, 15, there is an opportunity, there is a possibility that all these formats can converge toward one format led by the people of Afghanistan. And I don't want to use the other thing, because I know that was, there was a joke that if you don't want something to happen, you call it Afghan led Afghan own. But this time, but this time it should be you know, an initiative uh, by, by, by people of Afghanistan. So I think the format, uh, right now what we see, what we see that you know, people in uh, at least past six, seven months, we're talking about there was a very endogenous woman movement in Afghanistan coming, you know, from the grassroots but also from outside, supporting the international community. I think that's the sort of the seed germinating slowly. But also, this one year has given me sufficient time, or hopefully sufficient time, for a political class to sink a little bit down low and to understand that where we stand and how we can all converge around, you know, some, some sort of form. Attempts are going on in this direction. I know it's not perfect. It's difficult to bring everyone. But at least we can bring everyone who believes in common values of human rights, liberty, and a pluralistic Afghanistan future. And we can see signs of this. You know, there is at the civil society level a number of gatherings, especially in among the youth, but also in the political discussions, not in the very, very top, you know, the sort of classic elite level. Uh, I can give an example of young discussion that happened uh, in, in uh, October uh, and, and now there was a discussion in, in Geneva and, and now we look at here of course in different form. I think these are coming together slowly to create what's needed. These are small streams if I can use an analogy for converging into a big river that we will call it a national dialogue for Afghanistan. I think if that national dialogue which I see is going to be created Somebody doesn't like your national dialogue again. I will press for it again. <laughs> I think that national dialogue will be an Afghanistan-led platform which the other regional formats could convert. Because there is one rhetoric in all of these formats that all of us want the peaceful, prosperous, and independent sovereign Afghanistan. I think if that is the goal, then probably there is you know, a common uh, interest, and that interest should be led by the Thank you very and much. And on the neutrality, I can come back. Yeah. You, you want me to? No, 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 if you don't mind, because that's a big issue, maybe. Sure. But I think that neutrality could be part of a future of Afghanistan. I think a decentralized, <coughs> independent, and neutral Afghanistan is the future that we should aspire to. Thank you. Um, I know that I have to open the floor, but let me just ask one final question and one minute answer and one line answer. This national dialogue, because I actually have the word national reconciliation, we're talking about inclusivity, but we haven't talked about, is national reconciliation completely unfashionable? But okay, let's replace it with national dialogue. I really, I like that. It reminds me of what Macron did in France to everywhere. But now, somebody needs to convene this, this big forum of the Afghan. Is that, can that be a role for the UN? And then, here is also one moment I'd like to uh, uh, say that unfortunately Ambassador Wendrell, many of you know him, passed away two days ago. He was very much interested to have this kind of discussion with Maga. So in his memory, can there be a role for the UN? Uh, and if so, how? A political role to establish a national body? Maybe I can ask very quickly for each person to mention it and I'll open the floor. Thank you. Charge it I think the UN, I think the UN can play an and also because of their presence on the ground and the strong mandate. So I think perhaps more in the sense of helping 
us to, I think that would be a good convener, uh, but they can also somehow be, be a link, not be a link, but a link between uh, the international friends and what they are going to say. I think in Afghanistan is going back to, you know, from a sort of high level and, and, and very, uh, let's say, internationally very focused diplomacy to a normal diplomacy. And normal diplomacy is UN is that institution uh, to solve the problem. But also UN is an inclusive institution in that sense. Because if we can get, you know, for that national dialogue that I was uh, referring to, if we can get a P5 plus the region consensus that, you know, all these formats can converge into a UN mandate by, you know, by P5 and the region, and that's how the interest of everyone also could be solved. Even you remember, you know, during all these peace talks, every time there was a pressure by region, because region feel that they were not included, they were not in some places, that let's create something of a UN, because in UN, in New York, everybody has a say. Of course, not equal, but everybody has a say. So I think, ah, okay. <laughs> but at least, you know, the P5 has, plus few other. Uh, so I think a P5 mandated platform which can support this national dialogue, not having its own agenda, but converging all those you know, interests of platform from Moscow to the rest to China you know, to Pakistan uh, and other places. I think that is, uh, that is uh, a solution that's a viable you know, thing. Ambassador Peshkov, uh, a line or two, one line. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I agree that the uh, United Nations uh, could be a uh, Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry that we took a long time. I thought it was interesting, at least to me. I'm sorry about that. Um, may I take all the questions? We have been given only 15 minutes to finish. So why don't I take these questions as short as possible, if possible. Um, and especially if you have not spoken yet, if possible. Let me just uh, see how many hands there are. Um, I see a lot of hands I've already, we've already seen, we've heard it. Well, I'll just go around. Please bear with us, sure. Okay, thank you. I'm going down this road, this... Uh, and much of these formats and efforts that are for the possibility of saving the people of Afghanistan, we absorb. These are very important. We don't doubt that. But we need a permanent solution in peace for the country. And for that, I also appreciate what Ambassador Decker just suggested, that the United States is trying to look for some kind of coherent, alpha ideas for solution. That's what I tried to attempt, and I've shared that document with my colleagues, those who are interested. This is an approach that is program-centered. It's idea-centered. It's a process-centered. It's an institution-centered, not a person-centered. We do not wish for the international community to continue to focus on the old guard that are familiar to them. They are they have served their purpose. Some of them still can be useful, but we need to look for new faces, new opportunities amongst the 
of the population of Afghanistan who are constituted of Afghans who are below 35 years of age. We shouldn't ignore that community. We need to help them to emerge, to organize, and to be able to do what is required for the country. We need support from international community not to solve our problems, but help us solve our own problems. And that's what proposal is all about. Thank that you. we need, I want to hear if there is support for the possibility of creation of an international peace commission for Afghanistan so that it can help the Afghans create international peace committee for Afghanistan so that committee can then help with the help of the United Thank you. Uh, Nations Commission to help create a truly inclusive government for the people of Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. So I will thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I start with a question, um, Ambassador. What do you, how do you see the, the the role and the status of the Doha Agreement now? Because this is a paper the Taliban use only when they need to use. I refer to that. Um, they have not kept their promise on the basis of that. What do you see? The, how do you see the role of the U.S. and the position of the U.S. on this? On the international uh, pressure, I think <coughs> it's promising to you hear that. Uh, you know, the conflicting interests um, unite around women and girls issue in Afghanistan. Uh, we welcome that. However, I think the, the devil is in the details, as they say. When you go through the details, um, we haven't had much of uh, unity in action from our international friends. Um, for instance, um, you know, on some of these practical steps when it comes to sanctions, travel ban was one example. Um, uh, we are very, uh, women of Afghanistan are very grateful for Ireland, a small country for their stance on, on travel ban, which resulted in a travel, um, you know, lifting the exemption for travel of Taliban. I think this is something we really want to see um, moving forward in the UN Security Council for the sanctions um, on Taliban, because I believe the sanctions would respond, the sanctions would work, because Taliban would really want to work with the international community. Uh, they believe that they, they have gained so much in their engagement with the international community, and they believe that they will gain more instead of giving anything. So I think it's a time that the international community should become more strategic on their engagement. Last point. On the Afghan side, absolutely. Um, we have, in the last one year, we have tried to unite ourselves as women, the community of Afghanistan. There was political given to them, you know, they were kind of moved from uh, a military group to uh, a political group. Um, uh, now we don't have that. There is a willingness, enormous level of willingness by everyone to engage. And I call on my male uh, colleagues and brothers uh, to really unite themselves around few issues, if not around everything, because it's difficult to get united around everything, not only in Afghanistan, I guess, in anywhere, including in the United States and Russia and Iran. But to get united around few issues is something we call because this will help our cause as well. Your unity will help our cause. This is something we discussed individually um, uh, as well. Get united around few issues, but you need to give us the space. Give us the space means we have our own narrative. But I think for us it has been extremely challenging to even meet in person. A lot of countries where host these political uh, leaders or civic, civic leaders or activists, etc., they don't get in the space to meet. And, and I exercise their, you know, um, a narrative to come to action. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. Of the UN, I, I have a question on the economic branch of UN. There, there was some uh, process led by UN about economic integration and especially Eurasian rules. Um, there was this process called SPECA, uh, followed in Geneva, including uh, the trying to integrate Afghanistan with uh, Central Asian rules and also Azerbaijan and Mongolia. Is this going on? Is this completely suspended? That is uh, my, my question. Because it was not very high, a very high visibility process, but it was uh, with some interesting results on the ground. Yeah, Speka is that of the Commission uh, escape. And, yeah, I can. Uh, please, go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. No, uh, sorry, I'm going back to that table. Forgive me. Uh, very quick. Uh, of course, the former uh, 
UN employee, I strongly believe that the UN can and should play a very strong role in Afghanistan because it has the tools, the experience uh, in peace building, peacemaking, of course, dozens of uh, missions uh, around the world. But unfortunately, what is getting in the way is a lack of incentive compatibility on the part of the Biden administration. And President Biden was very clear on this. Season. Our priorities, are, um, Ms. Decker, you talked about the new tools. Uh, does this new tool include uh, cooperation um, among you know, the P5? Does the United States really see eye to eye to Russia and China on Afghanistan to really operationalize um, a UNAMA in Afghanistan to strengthen the leadership and as well as the mandate? Uh, and as well as to include countries like Japan, which is well respected in Afghanistan and can and should play a role and should have, you know, another Tokyo too, much, you know, a model after. Dr. Chief Dawoodi Murabi Onwa, John Rocks and Miroi Kadrasam, Commander of the Duke Voice at the Soviet Afghanistan, and the United Kingdom, and the United Iraq. And the United States, and the United States, and the United States. ما بسیار خوشحال هستم که بعد از یک نیم سال جهان متوجه شده به اینکه بار دیگر مردمی فراموشده افغانستان از زنان افغانستان اطفال افغانستان و سربازای اسیر و در بند افغانستان بار دیگر متوجه شدند و همه کسایی که هم از شخصیت های داخلی و بین المللی در این مقصیر هستند و یک کشور و یک سرزمین با هم دار و ندارش با تروریسم تعریف نشده ای که خودشان ادای از اون مبارزه را آغاز کردند و بار دیگر بعد از 20 سال سرزمین ما را ترک گفتند بدون یکی که میبخشید خیلی معذرت میخوام ببخشید گفتند که واقعا باید الان من وقت بعد بعد حکومت فراگیر منظورش از سرباز گرفتن از میان اقوام است چنین چیزی هم یاد در افغانستان وجود دارد از میان هر قوم یک نفر سرباز در صف طالبان هست هدف از حکومت فراغیر چیست؟ سوال دومی که ما دارم از دوستای ما سر اینجا اکثر کسایی که اشتراک کردن در صد وزارت و نماینده های ملل متحد مانند آقای نیکرسن که نماینده اتحاده اروپا بودن که یادی که زمانی هم انتخابات افغانستان متاسفانه یکی که انتخابات متقدی بود اونا تایید کردن اینا حقایق تنیق گذاشته افغانستان است بار دیگر از ملت ما چی میخواهم بکنم و برای نجات یزی کشر و یزی سرزمین را کاری مشخص شد چیست؟ ممنون، تشکر Those are calculations that the Taliban will make for themselves. 
Um, for the United States, uh, recognition is not something that is bestowed, it is something that is earned. Uh, and we have not seen yet the Taliban do the things uh, necessary to be considered a legitimate government of the Afghan people. And therefore, I am not the ambassador to Afghanistan, and we do not refer to me as ambassador because we do not recognize the Taliban. Thank you. Ambassador Nicholson, yeah. Thank you. Uh, peace Commission, I find it intellectually sound. I find it difficult in the second phase. How do you actually go get to the nomination process of the people inside Afghanistan without the Taliban being somehow on board? But I'm very, very keen to have a discussion on that. Uh, on the role for Afghans in Europe, uh, I do, I do put, 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 push it back uh, in the sense, please define it. We could think of a few things that would be useful, and some of them we already see happening. The mobilization, remaining in touch with and channeling and having a dialogue with Afghans inside the country, formulating positions, consistent positions, providing support, uh, advocacy uh, at the political level, interaction with us. But again, we are not going to be prescriptive and we think you are perfectly capable of that. Uh, finally, I just wanted to respond to the executive summary by a Pakistani friend, uh, General. Um, if you define doing something as military support, providing intelligence, cooperation, development assistance to a non-recognized regime, or recognizing that regime, I agree with you, we are not going to do anything. <laughs>